Hey everyone, it's Matt. Welcome to Umbrella Level 73. This is going to be my review of SummerSlam. Now, odds are you may have to watch the, this with the picture on Rumble. Uh, I'll try loading it to YouTube, you know, as is, without the screen blocker that they may make me put up. We'll see how that goes, you know. I'm not going to, I'm just going to skim through it. I'm not going to, um, you know, like play large segments of it. So we'll see if I can just avoid it. So. Let's start with the opening. Four hour PLE. Uh, let's, uh, let's hide that. Four hour PLE. We have the length of those matches. The match length is about 1.9 hours. So that means there's two hours in this PLE of, of, of promo and ads and just people chit chatting. And some of that was Jelly Roll song and, and all that. That was cool. But the match length, it, it was good. Like, I don't like the Ring of Honor pay per view where. They did have a lot more matches, and the whole potential quality matches, they were just too long. So they had like four hours of whatever. And the WWE's problem here was, thankfully, when most of us watch this, you can kind of skip the crap now, you know, which is what I wound up doing. Um, I guess my biggest criticism with WWE is before every match, they have a sort of like sequence, like a flashback sequence of the story so far. And the problem with that is, if you are a wrestling fan, you already know that stuff. And if you're a wrestling casual, you don't care. So, they could have cut this down by at least half an hour. That being said, so Triple H counts to the roaring crowd. That was pretty cool. Let's see if I can uh, do a little bit of this. Just a little, little bit of this. But obviously, we're not going to... You know, we're not going to uh, play audio. Those the Jelly Rolls opening was pretty good. Uh, uh, triple e. Precursor. All the sequences are pretty good. You know. This is all precursor stuff. So our first match was, of course, Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley. And I'm not going to play the whole thing, obviously. And so the camera, uh, the camera following the rest through the grill position, which you saw, I managed to catch a little bit of, that's an excellent to, to wrestling and filming technique. And uh, they also have ref cam introduced, which you can see in this screenshot in the ref's ear, which they knew a lot of shots from it. When they did, it was good. Now on the matches, uh, I'm not sure if W was filtering out the crowd noise or not. Uh, as 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 when I watched this originally, um, well the crowd wasn't into it yet. I think I don't know if it was, o it was an open air stadium or because of um, you know WWE is leery of cr of the crowd chanting things they don't want to hear her anymore. You know like show your bleeps, show your bleeps, you know or anything like that. Maybe they just don't mic the crowd as much or something. I don't know. Uh, Cole points out that the last time Rhea Ripley was pinned in a singles match. We were 26 months ago by Liv Morgan. It's a nice star element that we really couldn't have planned for. Uh, I really wish they would get rid of Dom's man skirt. And this is what I'm talking about. Um, let's add this in. If I can find the window for... There it is. Sometimes you got so much stuff on screen. Uh... We want to um, plus a screen share window capture. Okay, and uh, give me a second, guys. I'll find it. What's this? Yep. So is this up there? So this is Dom's man skirt you can see down there. I really freaking can't stand it. I wish I'd get rid of it. Uh, remove. Anyway, back to reality. Uh, they had a really cool storyline in psychology with that Lim and Rio both basically in Judgment Day coloring colors. So it was pretty cool. Because they were basically fighting for the control of the Judgment Day. Um, 
They had Rhea suffer a kayfabe shoulder dislocation, which the kayfabe popped back in like two or three times during the match. They sold the injury well. Um, with borderline in the era where you can't really kayfabe stuff like that, it's close. They did okay with it, you know. Uh, it's funny. Liv Morgan's ass was the center of focus of the camera whenever they can get it behind her. Uh, maybe the marketing, I don't know. Uh, Liz had an ama- uh, an excellent crucifix driver by Liv on Rhea. That's where you jump up on, on the, like, they're staying there, like kind of like this. And you jump up and put your legs around one arm, and you drive back this, like, and they land kind of head and shoulders first. It's a cooperative move, obviously, but pretty cool. Uh, Dom's full heel turn. You got to sort of cheer out of the crowd before they started booing. Or oh, you have to pipe in the booze. Anyway, the match was kind of a 7 out of 10. The storyline was better. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they could have done better, better work. I thought it was okay. You know, okay to good quality match. You see the shoulder selling going on? More shoulder selling, more shoulder selling. The oblivion the ropes and that's that okay so our next match Sammy Zayn versus Braun Breaker now this was a short match it was only five and a half minutes and the word this was supposed to go 12 or 13 minutes like like the other 12 minute matches but it looks like some uh, Sammy might have tweaked an injury or something I, I'm not sure why uh, Braun lives at 6 feet tall but he looks like he's like 6'5 I guess might be the Rhino effect, because Rhino has like three backs, basically. Uh, this is also two for two with kayfabe shoulder injuries, you know. I want, uh, um, unless it's a real shoulder injury, you know. Solid match. These two guys pounded each other, dignity signature moves. Eight out of ten. I'd like to see Bron Breaker diversify his in-ring routine a little more, though. There's that kayfabe shoulder injury we saw some of. Okay, so that's that. Next match was Logan Paul versus L.A. Knight. Um, L.A. Knight wins, obviously. I picked him. L.A. Knight made Paul, Logan Paul the first victim night of the hydration station. Uh, they fought for like three or four minutes before the bell was even rung for the match. I think that set a tone for this match. The crowd continues to be kind of ambivalent, I think, unless uh, no outright cheering or booing, just really hitting for spots. The bad director can work with his ugly head. Several this is the first time it had been present in previous matches, but in this particular match, like Elliot Knight did a hip check, we ran to the corner, and the camera was right on him, showing he, he did not make any contact with Logan Paul at all. So, on the other hand, uh, P- Logan Paul hit an insane springboard moonsault on the top of the rope to the floor. Reminds me of AJ Styles when he was a bit younger. Uh, uh, the L- Elliot Knight's top rope. It looked like a brain buster to me more than anything. That was uh, awesome. The, the, again, the, the spots got the pops, as it were. I, I wonder if Paul's foot in the rope was planned as part of the storyline or was a botch. Because well, you couldn't tell at the camera angle. They didn't quite show it directly. But this match was a 9 out of 10. And this is a little skimmy, skimmy. Yeah, that's the pre-match brawling. You know, usual stuff. Not going to go crazy over it. Bailey versus Nia Jax. Pick Nia Jax. Nia Jax won. Um, I like Nia Jax busting out a Cobra Clutch. I really would like her to use do that more with her moveset. Like like power moves where she dominates them with physical force. Like the Cobra Clutch. The full Nelson. Uh, you know, maybe a, an arm bar. Like a cranking arm bar, you know. Uh, all sorts of stuff where they have to fight fight it off and take a pounding. You know, maybe a guillotine standing guillotine. Uh, you know, some... Like a headlock that she really works because she's trying to break their neck. Stuff like that. That would be cool if I had to add. Uh, the match, however, had no real energy in the crowd or the ring. There were some pops finally when uh, Bailey hit in a cool spot. And you can see she had to work for it where she lifted the Nia off the second buckle and hit a powerbomb. Uh, but Nia won in decisive style. Double powerbomb and double annihilator after Tiffany was a distraction. I uh, You had this at a 7 out of 10, but I'm going to bump it up to 8 because I think... The, the the last third of the match got they hit the late hits on my spots and it was it got better. 
Um, you know, you can see this usual thing. Now, CM Punk versus Drew McIntyre. Uh, Punk, um, I picked McIntyre with shenanigans. Kind of had shenanigans. A winner, a winner with McIntyre. Uh, Rollins, I had predicted someone else, someone, a fourth person was going to run in on this. Uh, you know, what I what happened on Raw was what I thought was going to happen that night. So Rollins basically let the match turn to a no DQ match. That got the crowd popping. The match seemed to be let them fight. This is the best thing in ring storytelling so far in this event. They seem to be going with, you know, Punk maybe having, having some ring rust. Uh, and McIntyre explained that. And Punk letting his emotions lead him to some mistakes. I like the tur- turnabout where Punk cost himself this match. Same way that McIntyre had cost himself the prior matches. Uh, thematically, it worked well. Uh, I like them setting up Punk versus Rollins, too, as a as the next feud or part of the feud. So all in all, this, this to me was a 9 out of 10. That was like the coolest thing in the event. Seth Rollins sort of just letting him let them fight. You know. Our next match was Damian Priest versus Gunther. Uh, everyone knew Gunther was going to win this thing. The only swear was that the Priest might win here and Gunther win in Germany because um, the Priest has come on strong, but they were too deep into their storyline for that to change. I think Gunther and Priest must have watched Jericho for his Tomo Ishii a few weeks back on Dynamite because they were going heavy with the chops and and that was an insane chop match. I'll keep on saying it. Gunther reminds me of course when Arn Anderson and Larry Zabisco. This match is the second highest level of crowd energy after the previous one. Uh, there was a sloppy moment where the camera work again fucked up and showed Priest rolling Gunther closer to the edge of the, of the ring before pinning him so Balor could betray Priest and put his leg on the rope. Uh, this would have been an 8.5 out of 10 if it weren't for that sloppy camera work, which is 7.5 out of 10. You know. I mean, these two guys did good work, and I think the rest of the program, the, the, the camera work, and all let them down. Uh, I will say, though, Damian Priest, he deserves more of a push. Maybe they could have him, you know, uh, maybe they could do some rotations on... I don't know who has the IC title now. Uh, maybe they could put him in with a program with LA Knight, where LA Knight's a face. Eventually, he's gonna have to drop the belt to a heel. Let uh, Priest win that belt, and uh, like maybe in say November, Priest would go go and pro him, win that belt in November, December. Then Priest would drop it at WrestleMania to a face, something along those lines, you know. And finally, we get to the the the, the big the big match. Cody Rhodes versus Solo Sokoa. Bloodline rules match. I love seeing Arn Anderson there at the beginning. I always love seeing Arn Anderson around. Um, I, I like the, the part of the story where Solo had researched Cody to prepare for all his movesets. So he was, he was like, like constantly countering some of uh, uh, Cody's classic moves. I like the pacing of the match. And then let Randy Orton just jogging out there like he's working out. Not that serious. Um, the harsh pop of that was, of course, for Roman's return. And this is 8.5 out of 10. The, uh, the scrum at the end with the bloodline interfering and the outside interference by, you know, uh, by uh, the good guy, so to speak. Um, the one issue to qualify, so Jacob Fatu suffered, suffered, he had a great spot where he put Cody to a table, and he suffered a leg injury. I bet that that, that kayfabe leg, because they said it was a kayfabe leg injury. Um I bet that was because they wanted someone else to come out to run out with him, but they couldn't get someone, so they said just fake an injury or whatever, you know. I mean, Jelly Roll, did they, did they, Jelly Roll choke slammed one of these dudes. I can't, I can't tell them apart. Um, and then they did the Cena shuffle. That was kind of funny bit. Here we should see... Uh, Arn soon. I like I like the intro with the dog. Hopefully that's Cody really, really his dog here. Here's Arn Anderson. I love this part right, you know, right there. That's gonna be my uh, thumbnail as a matter of fact. 
You know, I might zoom in a little bit, but that's my film if I'm there. Took a while to get everything together. Blah, blah, blah. Standard, standard. Well, again, all good ring tell storytelling. And the, the outside interference. This is, this is Fatou selling the injury. He's doing it at the spot. Yeah. So, and uh, now he sells a leg injury, basically. Yeah. And then we get Roman, the head of the table, just walking out like the Terminator, the Romanator. He got a serious pop. And Cody wins. So, I, I, that's an 8.5 out of 10. So those are my basically thoughts. Final, we're clearly in the post fits era. There are a few things like that's bleeding in multiple matches and bigger guy doing more high-flying stuff or flying moves. And Vince did a lot of the bleeding and hated big guys doing uh, anything other than big guy power wrestling. You know, Judd Roll did a better choke than the most pro wrestlers. You know, although granted, what's face sold it well by jumping like as high as he could. So, you know. Well, anyway, those are my thoughts. If you have any questions, comment down below. I'll, I'll attempt to upload this with you know, that little bit of, of less than a minute of footage in there and see if W doesn't screen block me or whatever. And then if not, I'll... Re I'll, I'll I'll, the version of Rumble will have the full thing. I'll just, uh, I don't know what I'll do to the, the YouTube one. Anyway, my name is Matt from Unbearable73. Check, check, check us out on Wednesday Night's Overbooked on Legion Talk and Joker Voices channel, where we also do more post-SummerSlam analysis.